Welcome back to the second part of law sessions in relation to land law and specifically registered and unregistered land. Before the segment, uh, we were discussing unregistered land and I ended that break with looking at the four, four categories that we are going to explore in some detail now. Now, if we take the first category that I mentioned, land charges under the Land Charges Act 1972. Now, this was formerly the Land Charges Act 1925. The point is that the Chief Land Registrar is required to keep in a central place five registers of specific proprietary encumbrances which affect land. Now, we will deal with the one that is most commonest and which causes confusion, of course, with the English land law student. Now, the same chief land registrar has overall responsibility for both of these registers under the Land Charges Act 1972 and for the system of registered land under the Land Registration Act 2002. That is about the only thing that the two systems of registered land and unregistered land have in common because the only time we will talk about a register in unregistered land is when we talk about the land charges register. And as I say, it is the only register that you need to know about in relation to unre unregistered land. Under the Land Charges Act 1972, which is part of the unregistered title system, it is a register which has no relevance at all to the registered title system. If you are dealing with unregistered title, you need to consider the Land Charges Act 1972. If you are dealing with registered land, you ignore it. Now there are certain encumbrances that if they affect unregistered land, and are registrable under the 1972 Act, then they must be so registered. There are five registers, but we will only focus on the first one. The Register of Land Charges is the first one. The Register of Pending Actions is the second one. The Register of Writs and Orders Affecting Land is the other. The Register of Deeds, of Arrangements, and the Register of Annuities. But of course, we'll look at the first one, as I said, which is a register of land charges. Now, land charges are set out in classes of land charges. And you have classes A through E, but I will only examine the ones which tend to feature quite largely on exam papers. So, for example, a C1 land charge is a puny mortgage, and that's spelled P-U-I-S-N-E. A puny mortgage, of course, is a legal mortgage, but it is not where you actually deposit the title deeds. The other one that features on exams, of course, is a general equitable charge, for example. Equally, a C4 land charge, an estate contract. A D2 land charge, which is restrictive covenants created after 1925 and not contained in a lease. A class D3 land charge, which is an equitable easement, and of course a class F land charge, which contains matrimonial home rights, which arise under part four of the Family Law Act 1996. Now, if we explore each of these land charges, which I'd say are the popular ones and which you need to have some idea about, then we will see how they affect a subsequent purchaser, for example. So if in unregistered land you have one of these charges, as I will go through, you will need to ensure that you register them. The first one, of course, is a C1 land charge. This is a puny mortgage. It is a legal mortgage, and it certainly doesn't sound the way it is spelled. It is not protected by the deposit of title deeds because what normally happens in unregistered land is that you would generally deposit the deeds on a first mortgage, for example, with the bank. So let's assume in your buying Black Acre and you get the deeds, but you are using a mortgage, you're using funds by giving a mortgage over the property. You would hand the title deeds to the bank, let's say ABC Bank. 
Let's say you take a second mortgage because you want to, I don't know, renovate the house, for example, and you go to XYZ Bank. Now, because the title deeds are with ABC Bank, it means that XYZ Bank does not have the title deed, but it is still a legal mortgage because it would have been done by deed, the actual uh, mortgage itself. So C1 charge is one of the only legal charges that needs to be registered in unregistered land in order for it to bind a subsequent purchaser. Because the effect is that if it is not registered and you then go to LMN Bank, for yet another mortgage and XYZ has not placed a C1 land charge, then it will not bind LMN Bank. The next type, of course, is a C3 land charge, and this is a general equitable charge as defined in Section 2, Subsection 4 of the LCA 1972 as any equitable charge which is not protected by the deposit of the title deeds is not an interest arising under a trust and is not included in any other class of land charge. So the basic point is that if you're not looking at a trust and you're not looking at a type of interest which can be registered elsewhere and it is equitable, you may be able to draw it under the C3 uh, general equitable charge. The second category, of course, is non-registrable legal interest. And this is any legal estate or interest in unregistered title which is not registrable. It will be good against the whole world. Now, one of the maxims, certainly, uh, when you consider unregistered land is that legal rights bind the world. So when we look under this category, it means that it will bind any subsequent adverse interest and a purchaser will be bound whether or not he knows or should know about the interest and whether or not it is observable on an inspection of the property. Now the principle applies to the legal freehold and leasehold estate as it does to other encumbrances, for example, a legal easement and so on. So the point here is, let's say, for example, I have a legal lease. And again, just jumping ahead of ourselves a minute here, but let's say we have a legal lease, which is two years. Now we see that section 54.2 section 54 of the Law of Property Act says that a legal lease can be created orally. Now this is interesting because let's assume that you give me a legal lease on your property for two years. Now let's assume that I decide to go off to America, for example, and I go off to America and then you decide to sell the property. Purchaser comes in, the purchaser has looked at the property, he doesn't see any indication of my presence. Now the point is that although he sees no indication of my presence and there is nothing in the title deeds referring to me, my two-year lease, which is a legal lease, will mean that he is bound by it precisely because of the fact that it is a legal interest. The third category, of course, are equitable interests which are liable to be overreached. And this is where equitable beneficial interests under a trust of the land are capable of being overreached on sale. A lot of times law students get confused with the term overreach overreaching and overreachable interests. But it simply means that these are beneficial interests which a purchaser is not concerned with if he pays the purchase money to two or more trustees because the interest then becomes in the money as soon as the trust is created under the doctrine of conversion and then that equitable right is overreached as I said, if the purchase money is so paid over. Now, in simple context, what that means is, let's assume that somebody has put money forward. So I give you money to buy property in you and X's name, for argument's sake. I have an equitable interest under a trust. Let's use the basic trust, under a resulting trust by virtue of the fact that it is my money which pur purchased the property, but it is in your name and X's name jointly. 
being that the mon money is paid to two trustees, meaning two legal owners, meaning the two people on the title, because a lot of times people get confused with this paying to two trustees scenario. It simply means the money has been paid to joint owners. If that happens, the equitable interest that I have in so far as my resulting trust is concerned means that I cannot go to the purchaser and say, well, you should have checked because the money was paid to two trustees. The purchaser does not even have to consider me at all. And section 27 of the LPA certainly says the same effect occurs if the money is paid to a trust corporation because a trust corporation has the same effect as two or more trustees. The fourth category, of course, are equitable interests which are not registrable or overreachable and are therefore subject to the doctrine of notice. Any such interest is subject to the doctrine of notice is, is, will bind any subsequent adverse claimant except a bona fide purchase of a value of a legal, of a legal estate without notice of the equitable interest. Now that is something I would urge you to learn by rote, the bona fide purchase of a value of a legal estate without notice of the equitable interest. And the point, of course, here is that it must be an interest which is not registrable or overreachable. Now, what sort of interest is that? Now, in the previous category, I gave you an explanation to say that if I give you and X monies to buy a property, it will be overreached because when a purchaser comes, he buys from you and X. But here's a different scenario. What if I give you money to buy a property in your name alone? Now, overreaching only occurs when there are two trustees, two persons on the legal title. So a trust is not registrable and it is not overreachable because you've bought the property in your name alone. It means that if a purchaser comes along, what he needs to do is to ensure that he's a bona fide purchase of a value of the legal estate without notice of my equitable interest. And what that means is that notice to him may be actual, it may be constructive, or it may be imputed. Now, it is actual where the purchaser does actually know about the interest, and that is pretty self-explanatory. It is constructive where the purchaser would have known about it had he or she made the investigation of the title and inspected the property which a reasonably prudent purchaser would have made. And of course, imputed notice is the actual or constructive notice of the purchaser through his agent who has acquired such imputed notice while acting in a particular transaction. So to take free of such an equitable interest, the purchaser will have to satisfy all the elements of the rule. That is to show that he or she is not only a bona fide purchase of a value of a legal estate, but also it is without notice of the equitable interest. Now this scenario is a classic example on an exam question, and you've got to look for example in questions where there is a trust where there is a sole legal owner. As I said, doctrine, uh, the doctrine of notice says that notice can be actual, it can be constructive, it can be imputed. Now, constructive notice, the classic case for that, of course, is the rule in Hunt and Locke. And it's a 1902 case where it says that a purchaser must make sufficient and correct inquiries and if he could have discovered an interest, had he done so, he is deemed to have constructive notice of it. 
Now, imputed notice, uh, the case for this is very interesting and it is worth a read, um, at the very least in summary, but certainly from any good case book, I would urge you to look at it. And it's a case called Kings Not Finance and Tizard. Now, in my view, this is uh, the courts at one of its most creative because the court said that since the company had imputed notice of the wife's interest, they should have paid the money to two trustees not just to the husband alone, so that the wife's interest was not overreached in the case and the company was bound by the wife's interest. Now, uh, it is an interesting case because of what the court said amounted to notice. And one of the things was, of course, the clothes in the closet. Um, my problem always with Kings Not Finance and Tizard is, as far as I'm concerned, the husband could have been a cross-dresser. So even if the surveyor had seen the clothes in the closet, does that mean that it must have been a woman's, clo a woman's clothing or must have been, it been the wife's? But the case is interesting to see where, how far the courts will go in showing constructive uh, notice. Now, what happens if a registrable interest is not registered? Well, Section 4, Subsection 2, and Subsection 5 of the LPA says where an interest has not been registered, it is void against a purchaser of the land. And it does not matter if the purchaser knew of the interest or not. And the classic case, of course, is Midland Bank and Green. Again, a case worth a read because the whole point of the case is that the wife did know of the interest, but because it was a registrable interest and the person having the interest didn't uh, register it, unfortunately, it did not bind the subsequent purchaser, even though the subsequent purchaser had noticed was entirely irrelevant. We're now going to pause and when we return, we will start on looking at the system of unregistered title conveyancing. <laughs> 